welcome, change agents. Very excited to be here. Um, equally excited to be a part of government at this point um, in in my career, and I'm excited to be able to to welcome you to this program and uh, be alongside to embark upon this adventure of innovation. I'm uh, very honored to be a part of today's program uh, and uh, humbled to, to be able to be the moderator for this distinguished panel. When Becca asked me, I thought, wow, this is just exciting to, to be here with these these folks to hear about uh, kind of their the good, the bad, and the ugly of what they've encountered with risk. And I don't think that there is any better representation in state government than to have these gentlemen here uh, before you. So let me, uh, without further ado, introduce your uh, esteemed panel here. From the California Highway Patrol, we have Commissioner Farrow. From the California Office of Emergency Services, we have Director um, Gilardici. From the Department of General Services, we have Chief Deputy Director McGuire. And from the Government Operations Agency, we have Deputy Secretary uh, Drown. So with that, I will pass. Thank you. So with that, I will pass over to Commissioner Farrow, and then we'll move down to have a uh, five minute introduction of themselves and their backstory so they can share a little bit um, about so you can understand who they are and why they're so critical in understanding what risks mean when they make decisions here for the state of California. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's certainly a, a privilege and an honor for me to be here this morning. I've been here before with this group. I, I look out about this audience, you're very distinguished. You are the movers and the shakers of state government. And what you do has value, it has a lot of meaning. I'm not sure we always get the, the credit that is deserved from our communities because they don't fully understand what we all do. But certainly your absence, they would notice that in about five minutes if you didn't come to work and do your job. And, and I mean that very, very sincerely. I do appreciate the opportunity to come out here. A little bit about myself for those I have not met before. My name is Joe Farrell. I am the Commissioner of the California Highway Patrol. I'm in my 37th year, my 10th year in running the, the CHP. Um, I can tell you from my vantage point that the law enforcement was the career choice uh, from a young boy. It's all I ever wanted to do. And in fact, if you want to talk about risk, go to your first interview and tell the interview panel that I don't want to be an officer. I want to be the Commissioner of the California Highway Patrol. I want you to work for me as you go along and, and watch what happens. And, uh, but that was my career goal. It's, it's what I wanted to do, and it's, it's really, really was important to me. I can tell you as, as I look out and I look at risk and I look at what it means is that risk means about change. Change is an uncomfortable word for people. We all like to consider ourselves and talk about being progressive and being change agents. But a, a phrase that was coined many, many, many years ago is that change is the mother of all risk. Anytime that you want to move and you want to change the way things are done, there'll be a reaction. Some of that reaction is good and some of it is not because people feel uncomfortable by that. But I can tell you that the vantage point that you sit in is a lesson that my father taught me many, 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 many years ago about who we are and what we are and our abilities to think and be logical in our approaches to things. My dad in the military was a canine handler and his job was to train military police dogs. And as a young boy, I used to get to help my father uh, train these dogs, and we had to socialize the dogs into a family so there was human interaction, but at the same time, training these dogs for warfare, to be military police dogs. And I used to be at awe to watch these dogs as they would run into danger. On the command of the handler, the dogs would go forward and they would complete the mission in which they were trained. And as a young boy, I was amazed. I told my father, I said, these dogs are full of courage. They just take their mission and they run. They don't think about things and they just go and they always complete their mission. And their missions are extremely inherently dangerous and certainly a lot of bravery. And the lesson that my father taught me at the time, he says, you gotta remember that these dogs are animals. They have a stimulus and there's a response. And they'll do whatever they're trained to do on that response. You, on the other hand, as an individual, as a future leader in whatever occupation you choose to do, will always have a stimulus, but you have the ability for intellect. You have the ability to think about things and put things in motion and really carefully think about the moves that you make on the, what he called the chessboard of life. And then you have your response. 
And I think that's the important fact that when you ask me about my lessons learned about leadership and my lessons learned about change is that middle portion about the deep thought. What is risk? How do you manage risk? Is it worth the risk that you're supposed to do? Because he also told me that all risk is manageable as long as you understand it. That you understand what that risk is and you understand what the rewards are if you take on that risk. A good friend of mine travels the country talking about risk management and he coined the phrase that if it's predictable, it's preventable. And he refers to that as risk, is that if you understand it, it can be managed and it can be operated to your advantage. You know, the last, you know, little backdrop story I'll tell you is that in my organization, and I hope to spend a little bit more time with this a little bit later, is that we are transforming our organization. We are a law enforcement agency in the 21st century that is dealing, that we are dealing with a lot of public interest in what we do and how we deliver our product and what that means to the communities in which we serve. And there's an ability and an opportunity, but there's risk in how you change the organization and how you change that culture. And hopefully within the two hours that we're here today, we can spend a little bit of time talking about that. But in a short summary for me, that what you do matters and it means, and if you just take the quote you know, from Napoleon, lead from where you are. Just lead from where you are, whatever occupation, whatever rank you have at this time, state government or communities, your people, your subordinates, and your superiors are asking you to lead from the position that you are and help affect meaningful change in our organizations as state government moves on in this 21st century. So it's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to the opportunity to, to discuss some things with you, and thanks for having me. Well, good morning. I'm Mark, I'm Mark Gallarducci. I'm uh, Director of Governor Brown's Office of Emergency Services. And I say Governor Brown's Office of Emergency Services because we are an office embedded in the governor's office. And our primary responsibility is to um, sort of ensure that the overall state public safety and, and, uh, and uh, emergency services uh, is um, well coordinated and ensure that um, uh, when there's emergencies or potential crisis situations, um, we are ready to not just respond as a state, uh, leveraging organizations like Commissioner Farrow's and any all the other state agencies as necessary, but also our local government uh, partners and the private sector, bringing everybody together uh, kind of in a one team, one fight effort to be able to respond. Um, and, you know, um, Commissioner, I don't have to say a lot more about the risk and the kind of things that, uh, that Joe just mentioned, because it is inherent. Risk is inherent in all the th different things we do. If you can imagine in my organization, um, you know, risks come from uh, uh, various sources, influences, externally, what the public perceives and expects, uh, particularly of government today, uh, internally, yourself and what you're doing, what your boss is, what your organizational culture is, and what your mission is um, uh, are, are, are just some examples of how uh, risk could come at you. And as you can imagine, in, in my organization, um, it's not uncommon uh, that the governor would call me and want to know about a particular risk that's taking place or that we have to the state. Um, and sometimes those risks can be very esoteric. Uh, but sometimes they could be very clear in front of your face. Um, and so uh, understanding uh, that risk is inherent in everything we do uh, is a critical first component. And, and it's not a scary thing, but it's something that you build in and you understand, uh, you prepare for and you plan for. Uh, myself, I've been doing this uh, much like uh, commissioner for about 30, I guess now 30 something years, I can't remember totally. Um, I've had a, a, a variety of uh, coming out of originally local government, public safety, and then um, working at the state for many years. Uh, um, predominantly, my uh, background is in special operations and fire and rescue, uh, which which has a, had a broad set of responsibility, everything from counterterrorism to um, to you know putting wet stuff on the red stuff as it was as it was burning, um, but. Um, but then, I, then I, I went to the federal government for a few years 
um, in a new program that the uh, that Congress had put in place called Federal Coordinating Officer. And this was a program under FEMA that basically managed disasters around the country uh, on behalf of the White House. And I was I had the honor to be able to do uh, what they have what they call Region Nine, which is which is everything in um, uh, Arizona, Nevada, California, um, out, all the way out in the Pacific, all the trust territories, a uh, lot of lot of area covering the covering the water, and the islands, um, and uh, it was a phenomenal opportunity to be able to see how different uh, levels, both local, state, and federal, managed risk in their way, and also utilized uh, different kinds of principles, but also how change was the constant in being able to ensure that those organizations could respond uh, in an effective way. And then I left the federal government, went into the private sector for 12 years, and uh, put a couple companies together. And that also was a great opportunity to be able to understand what's happening in the private world. How do they manage risk differently? Because, you know, in government, we are mission driven. In the private sector, they're kind of bottom line driven. And, and risks mean different things to different <laughs> levels. But in some place, we all come together in a common set of, of, uh, of principles that, um, that talk about risk and how, how we um, manage it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more today. And then and finally, the governor reached out and, and asked uh, that I come back and, and run OES for uh, during his term. So I actually left the private sector and, and came back. And it's been quite an uh, honor and, and a privilege to be able to not just work for this governor uh, and and his, and his the kind of a piece of history of California, but with colleagues like this uh, that are truly true professionals, which I learn every day. And it doesn't matter what level you are, whether you're just coming into state government or you're just leaving state government eventually here. <laughs> it's always learning from others and understanding what other organizations are doing to help you channel where you're taking your organization. You get up in the morning, you come in, you're your own little enterprise at your desk, at your cubicle, and your office to be able to move that organization forward. So we'll talk about that today, but I am really happy to be with you today. And uh, this is there's nothing better, in my view, than having these kinds of opportunities to be able to share experiences and understand some of the best practices to make you the best leader in the future. And Joe's right, you are all leaders in your own right. So, you know, um, Appreciate being having the time to be with you and look forward to more dialogue today as we go forward. Good morning. Good morning. You guys got the flyer. I'm the guy on the far right. <laughs> and I don't look like him. Uh, but that's a risk that you run is that maybe someone will be called to the governor's <laughs> office on an emergency and won't be available. So I did find out late yesterday afternoon that I would need to stand in or sit in today um, for this. And so that's kind of a, a great example of what do you do when something does come up and how do you mitigate that? Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name's Jeff McGuire. Um, I've been in public service over 30 years, most of it in the tax area. Um, I was in charge of the sales tax program um, for the last five years before I came over to general services. Um, did a lot of things with risk, especially when you run a tax program. A lot of things is like, how is this going to affect revenue? Because that affects everybody else in government and, and what they're able to do. Um, I think, you know, like we've talked a little bit about change is kind of typically the driver of risk. And in government, a lot of times we're somewhat risk averse, you know, because it's easier just to keep doing it the same way. Our customers, a lot of times are hostages versus, you know, like they don't necessarily always have a choice. And so I think a lot of times we aren't focusing on them. And so I think doing this whole thing about risk is we, we really think about risk every day or we uh, look at it, but we don't really recognize it that we're doing, you know, risk assessment. When I was a tax auditor, we didn't talk about risk. What we talked about was materiality. Like how material is this error or this issue and is it worth the time for me to spend on it or should I just move on? And a lot of times in government, we just keep putting more effort, you know, and sometimes we would tell ourselves in the tax agency, we shouldn't spend $10 to collect a dollar because it's really not effective for everybody. But again, we have a mission at the same time that sometimes conflicts with that of having com full compliance or trying to gain compliance. And so I think sometimes in private industry with having a bottom line, it can be easier because you really have a measurement at the end of the day. 
in government, you have two things. You kind of have some measurements, and a lot of times we don't have the right measurements always in place. But the other thing is in government, we have a mission. So we might do things that don't seem like they make the most logical decisions, right? If you're the small business administration, you're trying to help businesses grow, you may sometimes make risky loans to small businesses. Whereas if you were a bank with the bottom line, you'd say, absolutely, I'm not going to make that loan. So again, sometimes our mission drives like different decision making um, that we have. I want to share with you one like risk or adventure change that I had um, really quickly is back in the early part of the 2000s, you know, everyone was moving to technology and in the tax agency, we still use paper tax forms, right? And we mailed them to everybody every every month um, or every quarter. They filled them out, sent us back money. Oh, that's great. And we asked the legislature, give us some money so we can create this e-file system and then we'll transition everyone to e-filing. Seems easy, right? You know, everyone will just do it. So the legislature gave us some money. They go, but we want the savings ultimately paid back to us. So we built this great new system and we sent flyers and all of our paper returns said, oh, e-file, it's fast, it's secure, it's convenient. We built it, but no one came. You know, we had about 3% e-filing and the legislature said, hey, you guys are supposed to give us a payback on this. And so we as an organization were really stuck. Like, how are we going to get people to transition without like forcing them? And I, I worked for an elected board who absolutely did not want to force anybody, you know, and mandate anything, even though the law really kind of gave us that discretion. Um, and so we went through this whole thing of assessing kind of our risk of how do we get people to move? How do we kind of nudge them? And how do we create the path towards e-filing to be easier than the paper path? So we came up with all these great creative things that government's really good at. We created a really cumbersome bureaucratic process <laughs> to keep your paper returns. I removed the paper returns off of our website. And then one of our board members said, hey, I got a call from a constituent. They can't find the paper return. Put it back. Where is it? I said, I took it off the website. And they said, you need to put that back on. So we did put it back on. We made it super hard to find, though. <laughs> so, you know, but ultimately, what we found is our customers, who are the taxpayers, really, once they did e-found the first time and we made sure it would really work for them, they, didn't, they never wanted to go back. You know, it's like paying your bills online or something. It's like once you finally jump over and did that, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you went, oh, my God, why was I writing checks all these years? I wish I would have done that. So I think a lot of times we have opportunities, and the opportunities aren't this great innovation. We're not, you know, designing the new iPhone or something. But we can look at what's happening out in the real world, and how can we bring that into government, and how can we find those paths to get people to, you know, to do things that will be more efficient. And a lot of times, you know, not Big Brother like deciding for you, but a lot of times we do know better than anybody else what the most effective path is for somebody. A lot of times they don't know. They don't know what they don't know, but there are customers, whether they sometimes want to be or not. And so I think the way that you ultimately kind of get towards this risk thing without making it a gigantic, you know, bureaucratic process where we run spreadsheets and numbers and figure all this out is really creating a culture in your organization that like we've talked about, everyone's a leader, but really encouraging everyone at the grassroots to constantly be challenging, why are we doing it this way? Is this really the best way to do it? You know, outside, when I'm, you know, outside of work, we do it this way. Why do we come to work and we go back in the 20th century, you know, and do things the other way? So I think it's really, it's incumbent upon all of us to empower ourselves. The best ideas for change, are in our own organizations. No one knows how to run government better than we do. And we just have to really tap in to those changes, but we have to be willing to take some chances, to empower people to take some risks at times, which is hard for government, right? As soon as you make a risk, it's in the B, right? <laughs> and then you're like, uh-oh, you're in trouble. So anyways, I think today is a great opportunity to think about risk and think about how we deal with it every day and how we can really modify how we deliver services in a way that's, that's different, but is you know, kind of calculated with what are the risks of doing that. And the risk of not changing usually is what we tend to kind of group think ourselves into. And we're really trying to shake that. So I look forward to this session and hearing from your questions and everything. <laughs> A 
Good morning. I'm Stuart Brown, Deputy Secretary for Innovation and Accountability at the Government Operations Agency. It's a brand new position, um, and so the fear, the, uh, the there's not much chance of failing because expectations <laughs> are low. But there's a huge, huge opportunity cost of failing. Okay, so that's I want you to think about opportunity cost of succeeding and failing. I'm really glad to see supervisors in here. Uh, with with our uh, our members, um, because we're going to ask you to provide air cover for um, your change agents, and we're going to ask you to help send the signal early on when your change agents start introducing ideas to encourage everybody to get to yes before they get to no. That's how uh, our secretary Maribel Batcher has has started the whole whole thing off. Um, one of the things, one of our missions at, at Government Operations is to modernize the processes of government. Um, and that's, boy, we, that's, that's a big job. And, and the, the deal is that, that you can't do that without change. And the, you just, that just is 100% of the job. Um, and people are, as you are aware, are, are fearful of change and fearful of risk. Um, and so we have to build a vocabulary and a, a way to build capacity, to talk about building court culture to do that. Um, and, and one of the ways we're going to talk about a little bit later is to, to get smarter about looking at risks and looking at the risk of the status quo. And um, I've been in government just over 11 years. I spent 20 years in the newspaper business. And I just... that. That left a lot of great memories and a lot of scars. And one of the scars is, if you don't change, things fall apart. Okay, newspaper business—you're driven on a daily, at the daily level, by um, the fear of getting beat and the fear of getting it wrong. And then sometimes those things, you know, prevent you from thinking about the larger questions, like, well, we didn't have any mistakes, but we did we get the story right? To what degree did unconscious bias prevent us from seeing the story? You know, so there's there's all these kinds of things you have to think about in that. And then kind of the bigger risks, well, who is this Craigslist? They don't, they're nobody. Why would they give away classified ads for free? That's dumb. That is not the right response. The right response is, if they give away classified ads for free, what are we going to do for revenue? What if somebody takes all our news and aggregates it on Google or Facebook? How are we going to connect to our readers? So those are some of the questions that were not adequately answered in the newspaper business, and that's why circulations are down and, and it's all bleeding red ink. But, but I, I say that to underscore the fact that you have to embrace change, and that means you have to figure out um, ways to, to engage risk and talk about change in, in ways that aren't threatening. And um, one of the things that, that we do a lot in, um, in our work uh, at the agency is, well, when we started, we had to figure out how to develop templates to, to take small risks um, and small bets, right? Small bets, low risk, low cost, uh, that could pay off, that might have huge upsides. And a couple things we did um, have the lean training program uh, that Kathleen and Dave were involved in and the open data uh, experiment which you know open data is not famous but the the uh, the process of getting that allowed us to talk a lot about risk and benefits and engaging the public and engaging change and and bringing new ideas for the four and and we we're basically given um, leftover money at the end of the year to do this and, um, and do it fast. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But um, you, so the idea is to um, be honest about what your risks are, um, figure out ways to break those risks into small pieces, attack those pieces, and realize that change is going to be unrelenting um, and that you can do it. And then if you don't do it, um, you know, your, your life may change in ways you never imagined. Thanks.
Thank you. So change is constant and risk is everywhere. The issue that we have in front of us specifically relates to, to risk management. So a new approach to the management of risk is needed to ensure that managers at all levels know and understand how to effectively measure and monitor the performance of their program areas and are able to identify key performance indicators. So part of what this program will be able to do is um, address those risks as it relates to the issue we have uh, in hand uh, for the state of California. So with that uh, being said, so Director um, Gilarducci, large and small organizations alike have the potential to harbor correlated risks. Correlated risks are a group of risks that might occur at the same time because there is a relationship of some sort among them. For an example, a correlation may be seen in terms of chain reactions. One risk event may give rise to another risk, which is often true in the case of natural disasters, such as earthquakes and hurricanes. A question about correlated risks will not only elicit an answer about those risks, but can also provide insight as to whether risk is being discussed in depth and across organization silos. What correlated risks do you see as key in impacting the state of California and government operations? How is your agency responding to correlated risks? And what, if any, are the implications on statewide services and operations? Yeah, that's a no pressure question. That's, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> that's all. Um, well, let me just say that, uh, you know, in, in our organization, uh, we, we, we talk about being an all risk organization that comes from a different sort of perspectives. One is that there's many external, natural, and man-made risks that we have to be prepared for to respond to at any one time. Fire, flood, earthquake are some of the natural uh, risks that we face in California. Um, terrorism, uh, cyber uh, security issues, or some of the technological hazardous materials, some of the human-caused um, risk that we have to face and um, you know California I often talk about being a nation state right We're almost the 40 million people uh, it's it's not it's a it's a country in itself large economy um, the actions we take and how we take those actions are critical uh, particularly coming from OES and where we sit uh, utilizing um, the, uh, a, a, a continual risk base threat analysis format that not only um, uh, is utilized with our external partners, state agencies and, and, and local governments and others, but, but internally how we, everyone in the organization has the responsibility to uh, understand what risk is and really it's a constant um, effort across all directorates in the organization. In fact, we've structured our organization because we operate in um, uh, an incident command format, which is which is standard for public safety in the state, but we've organized the organization as a whole around incident command. In other words, our organization is set up with operations, planning, logistics, and finance, which are which are the key uh, uh, components of any time of dealing with uh, an emergency situation. So that each and every individual employee every day is working in that sort of format can transition from a day-to-day -day into an emergency. Now, we as an organization are looking at risk enterprise statewide. What are all the different risks and what would those risks have as far as impacting to our state family, state operations? This is really critical because there are many correlating uh, or what I call cascading impacts uh, of any risk that we're dealing with. Uh, one of the key things is continuity of government and continuity of operations. These are two areas where we need to ensure that the state family as a whole has the ability to adequately respond to any event for the, for, for the case of public safety and ensuring that there's public confidence that the government is still uh, in a lead leadership role. So, you know, and that is not just at the governor level or at our level, that is in each and every employees level because they have to understand that their actions each each going forward is a is a component 
to ensuring for that continuity of government. And we set uh, metrics um, through uh, state emergency plan, uh, through what we call administrative orders and uh, emergency support functions throughout all of state agencies so that all every state agency has a role and a responsibility. Every, role, every state agency has a role and responsibility during one of these risk scenarios. And so we then work with those state agencies to train employees and, um, and, and, and train their management with regards to how to interpret those risks and then build sustainability in their organization, which then ensures for continuity of government and continuity of operations, which are our ultimate goals in the case of emergencies and, and risk management. And we have to do that internally. It's a, it's a complete day-to-day -day function in OES. We think it, we talk it, we write it, we train it. Those are the things that we do internally and we have to understand that risk and um, uh, is directly correlated with with change and so um, in, a, in a nanosecond an earthquake can change everything so you have a risk which is an earthquake it occurs and now in an in, immediately after the whole landscape can be changed and we as a state government have to be aware of that and have to have the ability to adequately respond and then ultimately recover. Thank you. Does anybody on the panel have anything else they'd like to add related to correlated risks? All right. Thank you very much for, for that. We will continue to think it, talk it, write it, and, and train it within our own paths. Commissioner Farrow. An agency can fall so in love with its business model and strategy that it fails to recognize changing paradigms until it's too late. While no one knows for sure what will happen that could invalidate the agency's strategic assumptions in the future, monitoring the validity of key assumptions over time as the, key business, as the business environment changes is a smart thing to do. How does your agency understand the key assumptions that underlie its strategy and align its competitive intelligence process to monitor external factors for changes that could alter those assumptions? Boy, these are tough. Um, <laughs> uh, quick, quick story. Kodak Corporation. In the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, manufactured the best film arguably in the world. They were the company of choice for film. When presented with a dilemma in the early 90s when digital first came on the radar, there's this technology out there that you could use to replace film uh, with digital. Kodak made the decision at the time to make their film better. Put all their investment into their film, make it better. And they didn't recognize at the time that digital was going to be the future. So you go down into the turn of the century, 2000, 2005, 2017, how many of you buy film on a regular basis? And the answer is probably not very many of you. And there was an opportunity that was averted because the mid-level management of Kodak at the time thought they gave withstand the pressures of changing technology by making their product better. So they stayed in the world of the status quo and they missed the opportunity. Kodak has since gone on. They're still a very vibrant, very productive company. But at the time, if you go back, that innovation was stymied at the mid-level of that organization because they missed the cues at the time. In our organization, the California Hive Trail, we're kind of the same way. We're, we are a siloed organization. We were for many, many, many years. When I joined the patrol, I realized right off the very beginning that the department in and of itself, the only way you can advance to the organization is to start at the bottom. You bring you to Sacramento where you, you train, you eat there and you live there, and you learn the highway patrol way of doing state government and state business. That no one comes into the organization at mid-level or at the top. You all start at the bottom and you move. And there's, there's, there's reasons for that, but also at the same time, it's counter 
not productive in a way because you lose a lot of valuable insight that can come into your organization from the outside world. Now you want to talk about risk as you start to look around what goes on in state government and specifically how law enforcement was, I want to say under the gun, but certainly in the interest of a lot of different people, you have to look at your organization the way you prepare, the way you train, and the way you deliver your products. And there's risk in that because your organization has been siloed for many, many, many years and they've learned how to do a job the only way they know how to do it. And so then you have to decide how you as an organization are going to learn the contemporary values of really what is going on in the world. And so to branch off, one of the things that we had to do was to go look around the nation, look around the world to see best practices and understand how other departments have been able to move, maneuver through some very difficult times. And a department like ours that for 80 years worked under this siloed mentality had to go out and branch off to be much more global, much more cooperative and collaborative with a lot of people. So we went out to go out and to try to get accredited by the Commission on Law Enforcement Accreditation, which is a think tank out of Washington, D.C. that was comprised several years ago by some of the top decision makers in really the entire law enforcement world to develop values and systems and policies that were very global and very meaningful. So then you take that to your organization that has been siloed forever and you bring in this new world of different ways of thinking and different ways to deliver products and you challenge people to look at assumptions and stuff, it's very risky because your organization doesn't like change. They don't want to move. They're, they're, they all consider themselves to be progressive, but they fear the change. Not suggesting the way they do things is always right, but there was comfort in what they really had to do. And so the, the backdrop of this whole thing is that you as a manager and a leader within your organization, change is occurring. The way people look at what you do is changing. The delivery models in which you employ today are being asked to be changed. State government in itself has to listen to those contemporary discussions that are going on in the nation and you have to look inward to figure out how do you change that and how do you adapt to this, this world? Because the system in which you have employed for all these years will push back against that change. But it's really, really important and this is where your co courageous leadership comes into play is you just go back and you look at Kodak. That they knew the world was changing. They knew there was this opportunity out there. They knew that the, the system they had in place was going to become jeopardized in, in certain ways. So they did what a lot of people would have done is they tried to take what they had and make it better versus going out and looking through the horizon and going, what can we incorporate from the outside world to synergize our efforts and make our world just a little bit better. For us, it was a challenge. It was a difficult challenge. We're not done yet. We continue to teach and we push and we change our policies and our delivery every single day. I still have a portion of my department, and I don't mean this in a negative way at all. They're traditionalists. They were trained a certain way in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's difficult to move them along. New employees coming in, they embrace it because they're going fast forward and they're bringing some of the, the others along. That will occur within your organization, but my point is recognize the changing and the rising. Come up with a plan to be able to move forward. Understand that there will be hurdles along the way, but if you don't do it, chances are you could be left behind and become irrelevant. And I think that's an important message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, it's very incredibly powerful. Uh, Deputy Secretary Drown, if managing risk is really important to the organization, the individual performance plans of a large number of employees at different levels of the organization should include a specific objective or task related to risk management. The performance against these would be evaluated at regular intervals. It is well known that what gets measured gets done and that what gets rewarded gets attention. Do individual performance plans include risk management? Do they or should they? Both, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, but I'll say yes and instead of yes but. We at the state have not, don't have an enviable record of doing individual performance plans for each of our employees. How many of you have met with your supervisors in the past 12 months to develop your individual performance plan? Oh my gosh, this is much better than I ever expected. <laughs> 
So, okay, add risk to that. Um, for the rest of us, um, you know, I, I think at a, at a place where, um, for, so yes, I do think that that's a good place to talk about, it, particularly probably at the level that you're at so that you can uh, figure out what the risks you're talking about and getting used, again, building um, uh, a vocabulary to talk about risk and change. What uh, Joe is talking about is he's building a resilient organization that can, um, if not embrace change, engage change in a way that that they can move forward. Um, so for us, looking at, at risk assessment uh, does start at the top, but it really is everybody's job. What what we would say is is um, the key key leaders should have a, a risk um, piece as part of their evaluation, uh, and it should be linked to your organization's strategic plan and to your workforce plan. Um, and uh, you know, one of the things that, that that departments do that I don't know if you're all aware of is is fill out these um, assessments every two years for finance called the uh, FISMA or the SLAY. It's, it's a risk, it's a way to look at the risk in your organization and, and, and try to surface some of these things so that you can um, work on them. And, and that's an area where uh, instead of making that just a chore, you could really make that a, an assignment that could make your organization a lot stronger, particularly if it's built into your workforce planning and your strategic plan. Um, what we're seeing in government, CalHR is part of our agency, and um, it's, it's one of the, is succession planning is one of our biggest risks. And so, you know, I would I would challenge all of you to to uh, think about who's going to come after you, who who you know who how are we going to build the bench, um, who how are we going to prepare and train our people, and both both uh, OES and, and CHP have extraordinary training programs, and they. They not only train their own people; they train other people. Um, you know, what are we doing to train more broadly to to prepare you to uh, to step into some of these leadership roles? Great, thank you very much. <laughs> Chief Deputy McGuire, last but not least, your agency's risks are not all negative risks. Can some risks be opportunities for the organization to learn, grow, and diversify? Please give us some examples of what you've done here at the Department of General Services, or even within your own career. Okay, this is a great question because sometimes positive risks actually turn out to be negative, right? Think of like the cigarette tax program. You know, we imp impose a cigarette tax to fund two things, right? Early childhood education and to get people to stop smoking. Guess what, when they stop smoking, what happens? There's no money left for early childhood education. And then the early childhood education people get all upset. Like, wait, where's our money? And so sometimes your success can actually turn into a negative for you, even though you exceeded, that was really your goal, was to get people to stop smoking to improve health. But you also really funded two things, so you took another risk if you really had success. So sometimes positive risk can actually end up, if you're too successful, you can actually have some negative drawback from that. Um, but generally, positive risk is looked at as opportunity, right? Um, so, like, there's a risk if we keep doing the same old thing, you know, what's going to happen? Um, at DGS, one of the things that we have is we have the state printer, right? And print is dead, we all know, right? No one uses paper anymore, right? <laughs> okay, we still love paper for a lot of things. But for a lot of things, paper is really changing how we use paper. And so for the state printer who again, at, at Department of General Services, if you're not kind of familiar with how our business model works, is we don't get general funded. Basically, we're a cost recovery organization. So we're a lot of times more like a private business within government. So we provide a service and then we charge you for it. A lot of times you think we overcharge for it maybe. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, but anyways, but we, we're kind of in that model. So the, the state printer is exactly in that model. They print uh, good, uh, you know, publications, other things for other departments, and they charge you for those, and they recover. But what you start seeing is over time, like, this whole business line, no one wants it anymore. Or because everyone can print it really easily in-house now, they don't come to us for the service anymore. And so it really kind of creates a change that's forced upon you, really. It's a disruption from externally. Um, and it's a risk if we keep trying to do the same thing, are we going to be successful? 
And for a number of years, we were starting to run in the red in our print shop, you know, so we weren't generating enough revenue to cover our costs. And so it really provided the opportunity to say, what can we do and where do we really fit in this world? And so, you know, kudos to our state printer and his team as they really tried, went back and looked and said, what can we do that's really still needed and what should we drop? What should we stop doing? And in government, that's typically not something that we do. We don't say, hey, is our product or service still relevant? Because again, that's threatening to us. We we'll all do it. Like, what do you mean it's not relevant anymore? But they really shifted away from certain types of printing and moved to the kind of more secure type of printing, variable printing, where like you're printing statements for people that have personal confidential information that we clearly don't want to farm out to a third party to do. There's lots of security around it. Secure printing is really for the future for us in government and as a printer is really an important niche that we're finding that everyone needs and we can actually do that really effectively. Some of the general printing that we used to do for everybody really is going away and isn't needed as much anymore. And so we're trying to shift the operations and really in a thoughtful way of how can we strategically change how we do business. Part of it also looks at this, you know, 50-year-old equipment that we have in this gigantic printing plant. And we're looking at, like, can we actually reduce the footprint? We're actually looking to move our printing plant and reduce our footprint in half. And actually just the savings that we will have in utility costs in the leaky building that we're in right now will pay for the rent in the new building. You know, so a lot of times, again, there's positive opportunities in other things that you do. Um, again, like I mentioned, like the e-file too, when we went to e-file, there's lots of positive benefits um, of moving to that. It's a real great opportunity, but there's a lots of inherent risks. And one that we had early on with that was that we said, well, look, a lot of small businesses don't do their own tax returns. They have an accountant or somebody else who does their tax return for them. So how are we going to get the accountant to be able to log on and prepare Jeff's return or Joe's return or whoever's return they need to do? So traditionally what we would do is create this you know, security user ID and password, then have someone fill out a paper form to authorize another person to come onto their account and use it. We're like, oh my God, if we do that, we're never going to get anyone to come over and use our e-file system, right? It's just too cumbersome. So we took a big risk. We said, look, let's attach what we would call an express login code to everyone's account. We'll print it on their statements when we send it to them. They'll know it. We'll know it. And if they share it with other people, they'll know it too. But if they have those two pieces of information, they can file a tax return. That's really risky. Everyone's like, oh, my God, what if a high school kid gets in and files Walmart's return for him? <laughs> you know? And... That was a concern. But at the end, we thought the risk of people really doing that, the great thing in a sales tax program is you don't give refunds. Everyone just sends you money. So we didn't risk everyone filing a bunch of refunds. FTB, this would be a much bigger risk to do it that way because <laughs> everyone do refund returns. But in ours, really, people always send us money. That's how the whole system is based on. And so we took that risk and provide this express login code. And so everyone could just hand it to their accountant and say, hey, Here's my express login code, file my return for me. And they did. And we actually never had a teenager file Walmart's return <laughs> um, ever with that. And so, but it was a big risk. We as an organization were really afraid because if that went bad and you got on the cover of the B that, you know, someone filed Walmart's return or Home Depot's return or something for them because we had lax security, I mean, that would have been terrible. We, all, we never gave anyone access to actually get into account information with just that code. You actually had to have a real user ID and password to do that. But we kind of created those two tiers so you could get the transactions processed. And so the last thing I guess I just kind of conclude with on this one too is that we talked about disruption earlier, you know, about Kodak, you know, or even the Sacramento Bee not realizing that when Craigslist gives free advertising for one ads, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. I think in government, a lot of times, the problem is, is that we don't have external disruptors very much, right? There's not another government coming in to put us out of business, or they came up with a better model. So we can get really complacent in what we do, and we can get really comfortable. And so what we really have to do, again, kind of going back to the culture, is create a culture of internal disruption, right? We have to look at ourselves in the mirror a lot of times and say, does this still work? Is this really still the best way to do this? If you really think, 
even really quickly about the Department of General Services. We were created in 1963 when government was a lot smaller than it is today. Most departments were really small and had very small administrative support functions. So they said we should have a central administrative support function that can like help us leverage procurement so we can all get better prices and we can do things. And it, the model worked really good. Now we're in 2017 and a lot of departments, their admin function is bigger than DGS's admin functions. They have all these resources. And so it really becomes the question of how does DGS still add value to customers? How do we help other departments versus we still act like we're trying to leverage, you know, this function for you that you're actually just as good at now yourself. And so how do we let go of some of those things and take some risks and let you do things on your own? But it's really, again, going back to somehow we have to constantly disrupt ourselves. And so we almost have to get into rooms like we do with the Slayer, what used to be called the Fizzman, but at a micro level, instead of the macro level of, you know, succession planning is our big macro threat all the time. But looking at micro, like in the, in the business function that we do here in our unit, in our section, is it still relevant? Can it be done a different way? What works well, what doesn't? What should we abandon? Is there something that we could take the risk and abandon? But we have to do that locally. That's where the real changes, the most effective changes will happen that will really impact our customers or those other people downstream or upstream from us in processes. Is really it's that lo those local conversations and those local kind of disrupting things that we should all be doing to make sure that we can really make effective changes. Great, thank you very much. So I think we are all going to go back now and create our IDPs and incorporate some, some risk elements to that as well. Go back and figure out how we can train ourselves to be prepared to take advantage of those opportunities that come our way. Perhaps look for some uh, internal disruptions so that we can further ourselves to be better change agents within our organizations. So let's talk a little bit about risk aversion. So within the state of California, the issue that we have here at hand is a culture of risk aversion permeates state departments, staffs, which challenges our ability to modernize state government through innovation and improvement efforts. So this is something I'm sure that hits home uh, for Stuart a little bit. So let's, let's address our, our first question here with um, Director Gilarducci. Innovation leaders empower experimentation, risk taking, learning from mistakes, and the valuing of effort rather than perfection. How do you create that freedom within your agency? Well, I'm, you know, the conversation is, um, is spot on. Um, you know, I think institutions as a whole, particularly government institutions, which, you know, are driven by, um, again, many of these, these external risks that we've talked about and, and internal controls, um, tend, to, tend to not be necessarily uh, places of uh, extensive innovation and because of, uh, um, you know, uh, of a fear of, of change um, to, to not change the status quo tends to, tends to permeate through organizations. This is really an area that um, as leaders we, we really have to work with our executive teams. You need to send uh, a larger message to all of the employees that one change is constant, uh, and it can't be good. And we we do that through through implementation of of metrics, uh, performance metrics, uh, but also building capacity from the bottom up. In, in my organizations, we built uh, something called the Idea Ambassador Corps. Uh, this was an organization. It's made up of employees. All employees has executive support, but it's really driving. Uh, innovation within the department. What are some great ideas? How can we take those ideas and implement them? Not everyone's going to get implemented, but I want constant input on how do we make our organization better? How do we interface with our partners better? Um, OES has a responsibility to be able to work with all state agencies and departments and boards and commissions to be able to not help them before the only only help them before the events, but also when emergencies happen and then after to recover, whether it's financial or or uh, operational. 
And so to be able to do that, we as an organization have to be nimble. We have to be willing to um, absorb change. And we need to think as an organization uh, in an effort that everybody is, um, you know, at, at wherever you sit is, is, has the ability to, to invest, provide comment, look at what's happening across the landscape and help to make the change in the organization. It's very important. And it has is, it is really yielded great um, uh, results in, in OES and being able to uh, get, and this is agency-wide, the state of California-wide, to be able to get this idea ambassador core. And then from the executive standpoint, actually implementing. On balance, at the executive level, with my senior team, uh, we, we, we every week have uh, in our senior staff meetings discussions about how what is coming up through the idea ambassador core what are some innovative actions that we need to look at um, i often say that you know you, you can't let a, a disaster or an event get out in front of you because you'll never be able to catch up you have to stay a step in front and because the risks are so varied uh, and the challenges could be so great you have to be nimble enough and, and have the ability enough to think a couple, a couple of, of, of uh, uh, levels above. So, you know, our partners at the National Guard, for example, they start their junior grade officers thinking, think about two levels up when you're making decisions. And, and, and we've incorporated that and are incorporating that in our organization as well because um, uh, everybody has great ideas. And we need to think about um, a new generation of uh, employees coming into the organization and what their expectations are. Uh, they use social media more. They use uh, technology more. Uh, they have ways that uh, they feel that can be done in a much more efficient manner. Uh, all of that must be incorporated and evaluated on a regular basis. Can it be hard? Yes. Is it challenging? Yes. Scary at times? Absolutely. There's a sense that government institutions don't change. But, but there is a massive shift. I've seen it in my years, particularly in the last several years, Secretary Batcher's team, unbelievable amount of shift in what has, is going on in the state of California. And, but things take time. And so um, I will just say to you that, um, that uh, this is something that an organization must look at constantly and um, incorporate it, again, in your day-to-day -day operation. Every employee is an investment they're the most critical resource. They're an investment into the organization, and, and, and we as an institution must invest into them as well, um, whether you're a manager, supervisor, uh, or line person. Great, thank you very much. <laughs> Commissioner Farrow, innovation leaders encourage employees to expand their understanding of both internal and external stakeholders. Who they are, how they are interdependent, who they are, and how they are inter interdependent. What are the unique contexts in which each one operates? Uh, internal versus external, uh, very very important. As you know, I'm a storyteller. So I always start with a story. Trying to book some airline tickets last Saturday, so I call an airline, and I get on the phone, and it takes about 14 minutes to get through the. The music, you know what I mean, before somebody answers the phone. I get on the phone, and after we spend about four or five minutes, the, uh, the receptionist, I'll call it that, says, well, you know, if you book through me, it's $35 per ticket surcharge for me to do what you can do online. I said, $35 a ticket? Yes, well, I'm taking my grandkids on a vacation. I have to buy 13 tickets. <laughs> so I do the math, and I realize, okay, this was a waste of time, I'll go to the website. I'll go to the website. And I get on the website and I start to maneuver through and I quickly realize it says you can only book seven tickets on the website. If you book more than seven, you have to call the number. <laughs> so then I had to call the number back. And, and the reason why I tell you the story is I am an external customer trying to spend my money on a product that's being offered to me by a company that is in the business to make money to provide a service. And so the frustration of that phone call for 15 minutes, going on the website and stuff, 
made me change the airline carrier, and I just called a different airline. And I booked my tickets, and I bought my tickets. Probably spent more money. I don't, I don't know. But there was a frustration. And so in the world in which we live, we live in two worlds. The internal world of our company, our department, and the external world that needs our service. And that we are in business to provide that service. And I think for us as our own department is that we understand our internal world very well. Uh, because we train, we live, we work together in our internal world and we care a lot about what occurs in that internal world. But at the same time, we serve really the external. And so for us as an organization, and we talked about coming, trying to get out of a silo, we realized that our sole purpose of what we do is for the benefit of the external world. And how do we manage it and understand what that community truly wants? And so for us, the change that is occurring right now is that everything we do, we do with the sole purpose of making our product more enjoyable and more useful for the world in which we have to serve. And so for us, it starts at the very bottom of the organization. I hate to use that word, but the people who actually do the product delivery all the way up to myself and every thought and everything we do is about that product at the very end of the world. And so for us is that we are embarking on what we call the enhancement of public trust. So every policy, everything that we train and everything that we think about has to be able to discuss those two components. How does it work within the organization? And ultimately, what does that mean for the people that we serve? And so we have asked every employee at the very highest of the organization to the lowest that everything you do must complement our efforts to deliver something good for our public. We have asked every employee, every manager, every mid-level manager to embark and to embrace the communities which we serve and to get out of the traditional thinking that, that it really is inherent in law enforcement agencies. We talk amongst each other all the time. We talk about our first responders and our partnerships in state government. We talk to other law enforcement agencies, both federal, state, and local. We deal with first responders every single day. And every time we talk to each other, we always pat each other in the back and we talk about how great we are and how wonderful things are and, and how we admire each other's organizations. But we don't do it enough to the communities in which we serve. And, and our communities have a different value system. They expect somebody to answer the phone when you call. They expect to understand what your mission is. They expect that we understand the unique needs of the communities in which we have to serve. And they're different. They're vastly different of how we go about our business in some portion of the state to others, and that we understand that, we recognize that. There are people that we deal externally who feel disenfranchised. They deal, feel like they've been left out. They feel like we in state government haven't heard what they really want to talk about. They feel that our delivery is not balanced. And they want to see it at the table, and they want to converse, and they want to understand who we are and what we are. Internally, we believe that everything we do is perfect. And that is a tragedy sometimes. And, and I think that it's important for you in your internal world. I'll probably tell you things I probably shouldn't. But at our academy for many, many, many years, we had this sign. And as you drove out of our academy, it said, thank you for visiting the world's finest law enforcement agency. Pretty, pretty neat, right? That's a, that's a great title. The world's finest law enforcement agency. And I had to take it down. And the reason why I had him take it down, because I don't know what that means. I don't know how you measure that. And I don't know who gives that title. But when you're the world's finest, you inherently tell people that you're the best of the best, that you have achieved some pinnacle level of success, and the innovation stops. And people just believe that they're the best. And what I told them was, take it down. We are one of the best. And that we are an organization that runs at 95% efficiency. And I don't even know where that number came from. It just sounded good. <laughs> that we are looking for the other 5%. We're constantly looking to way to improve. We're constantly looking at how do we deliver our product in this changing world? Don't tell everybody that you're the best. Strive to be the best. And as you strive to be the best, you're never going to be perfect. But as you continue to evolve and you continually to look for ways to deliver your product, the external world will respond to that attempt 
and, and how you embrace really what they're looking for. And so an airline that really wants your business will figure out how to get somebody like me to move through their system so I'll spend my money on their product. And I think in that little example that I had, they lost a customer who didn't understand how you go about maneuvering to use their product. The other airline, I simply called the number and somebody actually answered the telephone. They actually answered the telephone and said, we're this airline, how can I help you? Well, I want to book 13 tickets. I can help you. Where do you want to go? And in 10 minutes, we were done. I think that's important. It's an important lesson for all of us is where do we have roadblocks? Where do we have challenges? And where do we have opportunities to get to people to utilize your product and understand that you are here to provide a service for them? And I think sometimes, inherently, we, we fail to recognize that. And so if I can offer anything for any of us, look around in your organization and look for those challenges and look for those opportunities and embrace them. And I think if you can do that, you'll make your organization a little bit better and more manageable, but more useful to the people that we're here to serve. Thank you. Deputy Secretary Drown, how do you move from a culture of risk aversion, the number one barrier to innovation according to a Boston Consulting Group report on Innovation 2010, to one of calculated risk taking? Well, we've, we've talked a lot about building uh, that culture here this morning, um, but the key word there is calculated. And how do you calculate your risks? And more important, how do you calculate your your benefits. Uh, too often, um, discussions get stopped when people put up all these uh, uh, signs of, well, trouble, 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 and then no discussion of whether the benefits could out outweigh those risks. Um, and so you need to have a hard look at, at what those risks are and, and what the potential benefits are. And, and we talked a little bit about taking small bets and kind of building, if not an appetite for risk than um, some sense of uh, feeling of comfort with, with trying small things um, and accepting, uh, accepting that, that things aren't sometimes going to work right the first time. You've, there's this huge fear of failure, the f fear of embarrassment and uh, it, obviously it, it, uh, there's fear of showing up on the front page of the B and you know had I known in those days how that resonated in government, I think I would have made some of those choices differently. Um, but, uh, but also the fear of being called up in front of the, the legislature. And um, so you have to, are those real fears to the, to the people that we serve? And are we allowing uh, those fears to stop us from doing, um, taking the risks we need? So, so, you know, build a habit, build a culture um, of, of looking at things in this way and then taking, taking these small risks and, and, building the conversation um, around like, well, what are we doing? What's the real risk and what's not, not a risk? Um, we are betting on contagion, betting on you infecting others with these ideas. We're also um, betting on generational change, that people will come into government with, with different attitudes um, and, and different experiences. Uh, and that also includes coming in, people coming in from outside of government at new levels uh, where they previously were not able to get into government and bringing in uh, others' experience sets. Uh, so where, where people may have had a different experience of, of how this risk might play out and uh, what the benefits might be. Um, as, as, as part of that, uh, you know, in my office, um, you know, I'm not allowed to think of anything new, right? Because why try something that's completely untried and the, 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 the message from the secretary was find things that have worked elsewhere and see if they're appropriate and can be introduced to state government and can scale up. Uh, and so, you know, and if you put a couple of those things together, or four or five we've tried to put together that interact with each other, then those build a kind of a lattice that you can start building a culture around. One, we're really, really um, serious about uh, the need for employee engagement. We, we talk about, uh, you know, how to get people to, to engage with change. Having a, an engaged employee group 
is the way to do that. And, and what we found is you can't uh, add four units of X and get uh, better employee engagement scores. You have to actually engage your employees in the process. And so when we look at um, some of the things we're trying, uh, it's, it's very important to, to get uh, people from all levels of the organization. And, and one vehicle that's been great for this has been the whole lean process mm -hmm. improvement effort. And we've got that cut into different um, levels, but that depends exclusively on getting people uh, who are doing the work to, um, to look at the processes of the jobs that they're doing and figure out where it adds value and what doesn't. And often you spend a lot of time on things that doesn't add value and, and you've done it to protect yourself from risk and it doesn't even protect yourself from risk, right? Because it, it doesn't get the job done. Um, but when you do in, it bring in the employees to, uh, to take a hard look at, at what the processes are, you can, find, um, you, can, you can find the answers that the executives may not have found. I'm gonna pick on Tegan because she's here and she's been a raging success and, uh, and uh, has been extremely uh, influential, I think, in ways she might not realize. But, but she works in the Office of uh, Human Resources here uh, at um, Department of General Services and has been part of a Lean Six Sigma program and, and is very, has been so enthusiastic and looks at the numbers and looks at the ways they can change processes and really has been part of the contagion that we're looking for. And so we know what happens. Um, I don't know, how much time do I have? Okay. One minute, all right. This is, I've, I've said this one before and I'll, I'll say it again, um, but I'll compress it. Um, we had an experience, built, risk, risk being on the front page of the B. We had at one point when we were at the general, uh, at the government operations agency, we had a track record of six large failed IT projects. And these were ranging from 50 to 100 million to one was a billion. And boy, that is just not appetizing. And so we, we were looking at ways, and, and there had been some studies done, and, and they, the, the, the failures all had some similar components of why these things failed. Um, one of the things that we looked at is that they, they used this, a similar um, monolithic waterfall approach to design and uh, um, development. Uh, so they, they, they put all the risk until the very end, so five to years later, you might get to testing and realize it, it doesn't work um, and doesn't fit the user's need. Another is that we had um, designed our terms and conditions to protect the state uh, and to, to shift as much risk as we could to the vendor. Uh, and, and these are kind of abstract terms, but it, it, it also, in, in preventing risks to the state or hiding, it, it also almost prevented success and we put all these conditions on the vendor to a, to a place where we weren't going to get uh, the right um, project uh, in the end. It would be delayed, and they, we'd ask for more things, and uh, it could be way overdue and, and way over budget. Um, and in many of these projects, we lost sight of the end user in, in trying to make sure that uh, we were um, protecting ourselves. And so we, we put all the focus on, on protecting the state and it didn't say, how is this gonna help the end user? So, you know, we were trying to put the end user first uh, going forward with this user-centered design. Um, it, then also, in the work that we did, by putting all the, the risk on the vendor, uh, they built up um, equally large uh, bureaucracies of how to manage that risk and how to manage the cost and uh, with results that weren't, in the end, perfect. So these are these, when I talk about the risk of the status quo and how you have to really examine the risk of the status quo, these are the kinds of things that, you know, we've done all these things to protect ourselves. Um, have they protected us from success? Uh, and how do we know what is a real risk and what is just fear of repeating a mistake that got us before the legislature or got us on the B? So all these um, things that we add uh, to our to our um, to our contracts and to our uh, other things, we have to make sure they add value. And uh, the, the lean process I see are are one of our.
of our lean leaders here, Kathleen Webb. The lean process and lean process reengineering is a way to really start picking things apart and holding them up in the light and say, does that add value or, or not? Does it really protect us from risk? Thank you. I can test to that. I've taken the, the lean program and, and it is extremely effective. So I encourage, encourage all of you to sign up for that right away. So Chief Deputy McGuire, do you agree that besides breakthrough products, transformational in, innovation also includes business model innovation, such as entirely new ways to create, deliver, and capture value? Absolutely. <laughs> well, that was simple. <laughs> um, I, again, I think as we look at things, again, we're not going to invent the new iPhone here in government. That's not our job. But our job is to deliver services to others. Again, at General Services, our customers primarily other departments, right? But a lot of you, your departments are serving the public in some way. And so I think a lot of times it, we've talked a lot about it, it's the way that we deliver the service. And are we doing it in a 21st century way? Do we really need that same information that we needed before? I personally have a bias that like if government just focused on speed, we'd probably really improve a lot of things. But usually we talk ourselves out of speed, in my experience, because we go like, whoa, quality might go down, or we might make a mistake, right? So we designed these really good business processes that have seven people that review something, right? And so <laughs> does your quality really improve with seven reviewers? I think it degrades because everybody else is assuming the other guy like looked at it closely, yeah, I'll sign off, I know. It got it, you know? And so I think we fool ourselves a lot of times by these more layers or this more complexity. It's gonna really improve quality. I don't think it does. I think we really do know how to deliver quality services and that, but a lot of times we don't focus on what the customer is really after. And most of the time they're after efficiency or quickness. They don't wanna wait on the phone for 14 minutes to talk to a person who tells them to go on the website, right? They, they, they really wanna complete something. If you think about what's the one government agency that we all have to deal with at some point in our lives? DMV. DMV. And what does everyone think about DMV? Slow. Slow, long lines, right? I get to the front of the line, they go, oh, you're in the wrong line. <laughs> you need to go get in that one, you know? Um, but DMV really has done a lot of innovative stuff um, to actually make things easier now. How many people, you know, still do like their, their um, like, license registration through the mail or do you go on the website they'll take your credit card and they won't make you pay the fee you know most government agencies when i was in tax agency we let you pay at the credit card but you got to also pay the two and a half percent transaction fee because we're not going to pay it on billions of dollars but dmv it's not it's you know hundreds of thousands most of the time so again each transaction small they actually you know got funding for that pay that fee that makes it easier because that'll be a barrier to a lot of us we go like well, i don't mind paying my registration but i don't want to pay a fee on top of it right so they really looked at how to kind of challenge some of those things so i think you know we need to look at our business processes because that's what our customers deal with and i keep going back to this it's really it's about our culture and it's about how we talk to ourselves. It's about doing things at the micro level most of the time. The best solutions are going to happen lower in. I'll give you a really quick example of when I was, again, in the tax program. I went out, we had field offices all over California. And I would go out and visit them once a year. And when I went out on this one trip, there was one headquarters section that they universally all loathed and complained about. And they said, it's like crazy. We have to fill out these forms. We send them to them. And we're waiting to process things on our accounts, but we have to wait for them to do it. We don't know what happened to it. We wait weeks and weeks, and we keep looking at the computer, hoping that maybe someone fixed it for us. We don't even know who to contact to find out what happened. And so one day someone in a fill-up said, like, instead of doing those forms, couldn't we just send them an email and ask them to do it for us? And so I was like, oh, I don't know, because there's lots of transactions. Could we just take like a generic email and do that? So I went back to that headquarters. You're like, well, like you know, everyone hates you guys. <laughs> and uh, because they can't figure out what's going on. And you guys don't even know where all those paper you know, forms are, who has them and stuff. I said, so everyone, know, can you just do an email and let them just tell you what they need you to do and you'll just do it. And so they said, oh, yeah, I guess we could do that. So they got rid of their forms and they just created a generic email box. So when they got all their requests, they actually know who they 
assigned it to. Actually, then the person who requested it knew who it was assigned to. And then the next year, when I went around to all the field offices, the number one headquarters section they loved was that unit now. And they said, oh my gosh, they fixed something in a day for me. It used to take six weeks. You know, and I knew who it was. I could follow up with them. That was really a simple business process change. It was tiny. You know, in the scheme of things, it wasn't that risky for us. It was really easy. But it made a huge difference to the customers, which in that case were internal customers. You know, field offices waiting to do things that ultimately were fixing things for external customers, taxpayers. And so I, I really think that Again, the most important thing is to create a culture where you do challenge the status quo. I, want, I keep going back to that, is that, and empowering people to do that. And again, in our organization, we had what we called kind of seven goals. They were really seven values, and there were things like focus on the customer, let's do innovative business processes, let's Googly manage information more effectively. Um, we did those. And we kind of did a big rollout trying to get everyone to do that. We made posters, we did everything. And it took about a year and a half or two years but all of a sudden you heard people say things in conversations in passing where they go like, hey, are we really focusing on the customer when we're doing this? Hey, I don't think this is a very innovative way to do things. That's when you know things are really happening in your organization, when everyone throughout is starting to use those common words and they're challenging things. Because it's easy to say, but usually we say it once, we move on, and we hope that like it changed everything. It really doesn't. It takes a constant effort to do that. I think I'd like to wrap up with one last thing is that if you think of a business, they invest in research and development, right? You know, or like a sports team. They practice and then they play the game, right? But they get to practice. In government, we never get to practice and we don't generally do research and development. And so we're hoping that somehow it just kind of happens. You know, like, <laughs> hey, when you get a chance from all the other stuff you're working on, could you actually be really innovative? Or like, you know, be really creative and change in your business process. That doesn't happen. So I think one of the things we need to do in our organizations is really consciously make some decisions of how we're going to invest some of our time in doing these things. And I definitely like the idea ambassador core. And I mean, I think that's a prime example of how the, an organization is investing, saying like, we really do need to stop a little bit, slow down so we can ultimately speed up but slow down and actually talk about these issues and evaluate these issues. Because if we don't, we'll never get a chance because we're all busy. And so really think about how are you going to drive that. And you can do that a lot of times at the micro level within your own units or sections. And the changes that you make there will have gigantic impacts at times that you may not even realize. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So our next phase of the program uh, is integrating you into the dialogue and the discussion. One of the things that we found from last year is uh, we lose that discussion in our videotapes. You're important to this and important to the outcome. So if you want to ask a question, we ask that you line up over here. And we have our first taker. Silicon Valley is the capital of innovation, entrepreneurship, and risk taking. What is the role and contribution of the government to flourish Silicon Valley? So, I mean, I'm, I don't want to speak for policy for the state of California, but uh, speaking from my old days at, at the Little Hoover Commission, it was is is to have uh, you know a fair and transparent legal system, a fair and transparent tax system, uh, and to protect the quality of life so that people uh, who who live here are comfortable here, uh, and to to um, to minimize uh, uncertainty and to um, in terms of the of the state doing things that are unexpected to to be predictable and open in in the way we conduct our business so they're to to reduce their level of uncertainty you know I'll, i may think of my little different perspective because um you know i mean there there is a fire line a firewall to some degree between public and private because of the different sort of mission sets but 
there also is this tremendous need, and this is how I think that we support places like Silicon Valley and innovation, and that is building sort of these relationships, public-private relationships. For example, in my organization, we have embedded um, organizations like uh, Google and Cisco and others that have, uh, we want to leverage what we can't in state government to our best advantage to provide the best customer service that we can. In our case, let's talk about situational awareness or um, uh, uh, utilizing technology to get a better sense of what's happening, sort of artificial intelligence, if you would, to be able to pull information or track resources. Some of, some of that capability we may not have, but our private sector partners do. And so what we do is we want to offer and build relationships uh, so that we are finding that common set of opportunities to be able to uh, move forward. That doesn't mean that we're giving anybody a business advantage or not, but we're getting everybody to start thinking, both on government and in the private side, that there are sets of common commonalities that are in their best interest and our best interest to be able to, to uh, address issues. And that we do that in a lot of different variety of areas. In our case, we do it in, in emergency management, we do it in cybersecurity, uh, we do it in our intelligence network uh, team. There's a lot of areas that we have taken that capability and, and, and built in. And I think of all the different agencies that are up here represented, we all do it. Uh, but it's it, 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 you have to f figure out how, how best to move forward. The Silicon Valley individual companies wish that they were the, the number one and get the contract. Sure they do, but but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about building those those uh, understanding and, and relationships that can help each other move forward. I guess I'll ask, add one example is that, um, again, in, a lot of times private industry can look at there's opportunities to do something kind of related to us because sometimes we are challenging. And so I know in the tax world, a lot of times, um, the companies that provide all that data that knows everything about everybody and everything, a lot of times they would come to us because they would want they would have some theory and they would go, hey, can we work with you guys to figure out if some theory that we have works kind of with your data? And a lot of times we're dealing with very confidential data, especially in the tax area. And so a lot of times there's kind of barriers of how much you can share and do things. But we did a lot of partnerships with them that helped them kind of expand what they could offer to others. But we also benefit from it too because a lot of times we were a customer of theirs um, because we were needing that kind of service anyway. So sometimes there's opportunities to actually be partners with each other because a lot of the things we're doing are challenging and the things that they can help develop with us give them something that they can actually make on a larger scale that can actually be a benefit to others as well. I'll just add the last thought that you know, there are many partnerships that we have going on right now with technology and the one that is nearest dearest to us that we spend a lot of time with is the autonomous vehicle. The Department of Motor Vehicles has taken the lead role with the autonomous vehicle but the California High Patrol has been embedded to teach these cars this automation on how to drive, the right way to drive. Not the way we traditionally drive but the way you <laughs> should be driving. And, it, and it's very important to be able to teach this, we'll call it a computer, this computerized system on how to maneuver a vehicle through heavy traffic and really what to do in situations that are not always apparent to a lot of people. And so as we have those partnerships, the end product at the very end of the day will be a shared responsibility between state government and the private entrepreneurs who are trying to develop that product. So you'll see a lot of that in state government going on right now. Okay, next innovator that's going to. Uh, the uh, iPhone has changed the world on the social, political, economic ways. And um, make this agnostic. This. Are there ways that the smartphone uh, can be used both internally and externally by the state to improve our service? I'll, I'm going to start it, and I am certainly not the uh, uh, appropriate person really to talk about technology from that standpoint. I can tell you that at least today, the state is embracing that technology, because I can remember a few years back when we tried to buy the iPhone, and we couldn't. 
Remember that? We couldn't buy it. And uh, we, we had uh, uh, different devices out there, and state the government prohibited you from, from buying those devices because at the time it was deemed to be uh, a novelty versus something technology we had to have. But I can tell you for, for us and our organization is it is a vital link for us to the external world that most of the products that we see on the horizon that we are going to be able to do uh, will be based on the technology of the iPhone. That, that we see a day at some point that every employee within the organization will have that technology at their disposal because we have ways that we can take accident reports, citations, any type of reports that we have to do and at the very push of the button, eliminate the need for paper, deliver it straight to the court, actually deliver it to you as the end user who needs the report that we have to have. And so that technology is out there and we have to embrace it. And, uh, and I think that is the product of the, of the future. Yeah, you know, um, I think, you know, again, it's really, you know, iPhone, not to say one iPhone, uh, Android, you know, smart tablet capabilities absolutely, I think, are in the, are, are coming uh, in, in, into, into view better. Uh, organizations are getting a better sense on how to use them. Uh, in, in our world, you know, we oversee public, all public safety communications in the state, statewide. Um, there's an initiative that we're working, for example, where, like, I have all, all the 911 centers in the state, and we're moving to next-gen 911, and being able to use smartphones to be able to communicate with 911 centers, texting to 911, video to 911. But that does not come without risk, okay? If a dispatcher is listening to a crime take place and sending information to the officers responding, it's different than the dispatcher actually watching it take place and the impacts that have on the dispatcher and the, and the ability to process what they're seeing and putting it into uh, a, di a dispatch out to the officers. So uh, the other thing is we have something called FirstNet. It's an initiative that's going on nationwide to build a broadbanding capability for public safety communications all on these smartphone devices. So your smartphone uh, eventually will be sort of the the place you're going to get, if you're in public safety, you're going to be getting data, maps, uh, a photo will pop up, maybe a, if on, a, on a criminal run, you can be able to see that on your phone at the immediate time. In emergencies, you'll be able to get other kinds of data. Um, uh, that's actually happening, and um, that will become the new norm. We are putting in, in California, an earthquake early warning system. Earthquake early warning will give you a warning in advance of the shaking actually happening. Think about that for a second. You could do a lot of different things to protect yourself, but businesses and our infrastructure could actually respond positively to, to buy down any risk that the, the, a major earthquake could have to their, to their manufacturing lines, to power, water, other infrastructure. That You'll all get that on your smartphone. So the, the answer is we have just begun, I think, to really understand that. And, and, and the commissioner is right. I mean, I remember when we didn't have, I, mean, I remember I had a little pager to get a page, pull off the side of the road, put my coins in the phone, call the headquarters, and, and, and check, yes, I got a page. You know, it's a 911, what is it? Uh, what do you want for lunch? No, yeah. that, that was a, uh, but the, the point is, is that we have come so far and, and, and in the future, it is all that. Our comm centers, our command centers, our day-to-day -day engineers going out, doing assessments, being able to automate that information. A lot to do. It's very exciting, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that we just have to face, again, like kind of the change that are happening, the Kodak example. Everyone uses this device that I've got in my pocket, you know, more to connect to the Internet and to do things than their computer now. This is really have substituted that. And so in all aspects, I think we have to look at, again, how can we, whether it's a customer internally, externally, how can we utilize these devices to make transactions easier, simpler, more efficient, more safe? How can we do those things with them? And I think government's actually done quite a bit. You know, as we, you know, we originally built websites and then everyone, you know, they didn't translate over to mobile devices, but we all now build websites with mobile capability as well. And so I think it's continuing to look at like, again, thinking of focusing on the customer, what do they want to do? That's the device they're going to use. 
You can say, oh, go, go to the library and get your computer, you know, or go home and get your computer. They go, no, I want to do it right now with this that's in my hand. And so I think, again, as we think about those customers, it's always like, how can we make those transactions easier? How can we get away from paper, signatures, things like that? How can we still do things, which brings some risk? We're always good at identifying the risks. We're typically good at group talking ourselves out of doing anything because <laughs> we thought of all the risks. But it's really kind of embracing some of these things and looking at, you know, if we don't do it, we just become irrelevant or we just frustrate everybody, right? We all go back to get in line at DMV, you know, like <laughs> we talked about earlier. So I think we have no choice. It's a disruption. But in government, we kind of do have a choice. We can just be, a, you know, a resistor. And I think we have to find ways to embrace and use that. And I think that the other thing for us that's a challenge is just having the technological capabilities or bandwidth within an organization. Everyone wants more technology, but you only have a, you know, a certain size IT shop. And so they go like, we can work on these first five, but like these last five, we don't have the capacity. So I think as we talk about risk and kind of benefits is like, how do we really have the right governance internally to make sure we're doing the most efficient, effective things that are really giving us the biggest benefit instead of we're just kind of getting in the squeaky wheel, you know, what they want. So I think that's a challenge for us too is a lot of times capacity to adapt to some of the new technology. So I think the recent uh, stats showed that 40% uh, of the hits, um, I think it's probably gone up since we did the thing, 40% of the hits on state government websites were from mobile devices. Um, Secretary Batcher in May held a, uh, a session for um, department directors and their comms people to start thinking about what that would mean. How could they turn their websites, instead of a website, into a digital service? And that requires looking at what you have on your website and saying, does this benefit the, the user or does it is it a billboard for the kinds of you know programs we're having? And 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 uh, so the the whole thing was centered around user-centered design and how to go from user-centered design to uh, digital service. And we've, we've, we had uh, examples from, from Oakland, but we had also examples from state government. Uh, the Department of Social Services is being uh, really thoughtful on how they're doing this. They're moving as fast as they can with, with the care that they're taking in it. It does cam come down to, well, do you need 50, do you need a 50 page application to sign up for uh, CalFresh, you know, how, and how would you do that on a phone? Well, you can't. So you, it's how to rethink uh, your processes to jam them down into something that could be used on a smartphone that gives you all the information that the department needs for the program, and you can go back to them. You've, you've established a relationship there. You can go back and get more information, but also thinking about what the user needs and where they're going to get it. It turns out that a, a very high percentage of the people that we serve have smartphones, so that's that's something we need to start thinking in terms of our design from the very beginning. One quick thing, our Cal IPGCA training program that we flip the switch on tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Um, is, um, according to our provider, totally accessible to you through your iPhone and through your iPad, not just at your desktops. So um, have we deployed it in the program? No, but um, um, we're, that's where I say we're innovating innovation and you will be the first so that's looking at mobily deploying uh, government training through your iPhone so and you will be the people at the front of the line trying this out uh, we had I'll get back to you um, so I'd like to ask how you think your what what can your organizations do or what are your organizations doing to incorporate more women in your organizations as agents of change and um, I mean that not just in the sense of ensuring that you're promoting women into those leadership roles um, both at the mid manager level but also in your executive teams but also just promoting um, and ensuring that there is a shift in your organizational culture that that allows your both your organization and women themselves to see themselves as agents of change. I guess I'll start because I was holding the mic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I my experience has been in government um, over the years is that really we've kind of 
done a really good job of having a more of a mix. When I first started in state, there was a lot more men than women, but now there's actually a really broadband. I've had a number of women bosses, you know, so I don't think there's really, in my experience, a kind of a glass ceiling within the government organization. I know we always talk about the difference between kind of, you know, the sexes and kind of how we think and women can use both sides of their brain at once, but men can only use one or something, you know. Um, so I think we see value in all of that. I've just, I guess in my mind, it's looking at everyone as an individual and just trying to embrace what they bring to that. And I see less and less maybe what was institutional bias or um, just, kind of happen chance of what used to be before. Um, so I, in my own bias, I mean, I just don't see that we have a challenge with that. But I do see that as change happens, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't like strip everybody out and replace them with a new group. And so in some areas, you can see there's there's less change that has occurred and in other areas where there's more. But um, I really think in state government, we do a, a pretty good job. And again, I know we're not perfect, but really kind of making everybody an individual, not a man or a woman or a, a this or that. But that's just kind of from my perspective. Um, and I'm a man, so I don't know if that's a valid perspective. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, so the the important thing is, is the signals. And I mean, raw numbers is, is, is the very basis, but the important thing is is signals and um, in, in the executive levels and in the CEA levels, we're seeing um, parity. We have in the CEA ranks, we have uh, virtually an even split. Um, what we're, we're focusing on in our, our civil service improvement uh, initiatives is, is developing uh, a culture of embracing cognitive um, diversity. So to, to when you have discussions, particularly in hiring, um, to, to make sure that the hiring panel and the interview panel have people from all different backgrounds and different genders so that you, you build a culture of awareness and inclusion so that you, you bring up these ideas. We're working right now with um, McKinsey and Company. They are giving us their time to talk about how to look at uh, unconscious bias and to, to look at strategies for, for weaving, weeding that out. Um, an issue that, that we are, um, that is tougher, uh, and we, we report it every year, um, but we're still not satisfied, is there is a gender pay gap at the state of California that's about 20%, and it's, it's concentrated in uh, pay grades where women uh, make less than $70,000, and so we're working um, on a project to figure out wh why why that is and, and what's happening exactly with the uh, the um, upward mobility program. I don't know if you all are familiar with that, but when I asked about IDPs, it had to do with my experience in, in very low low numbers of IDPs in some of these pay classifications. And so we're, we're uh, starting a research project on that and we've hired somebody to do fo some focus groups to help us work through those issues. And, and I can assure you the secretary is extremely serious about this. We're going to our one last question now. Hello. Um, my question is actually fairly simple in theory. Um, so this whole group and get together is about change. Well, what have you guys done, or what have you gentlemen done within your group to help facilitate bringing change to it from a perspective of how do people within your agencies propose change? Uh, the agency I work for has been a challenge when I've tried to bring that stuff up. I've been told point blank by supervisors, that's not the way we do it. We've done it this way always. We're not going to change in those words. And so how have you worked to help bring those ideas up through the food chain to where they can make a difference? So, uh, again, I've told in the mic. <laughs> uh, again, I, I think I've kind of restate what I said before, but I think it's kind of trying to shift the culture. And again, that doesn't happen overnight. It's relentless. You have to be very intentional about it because my experience, and I think if you look at like um, the data on change management in general, the biggest resistance is the people in the middle. And it's, I, and I don't know if that's because they have the most to lose maybe with change or they've just been around longer so they're more comfortable with the way things are. Um, and so 
thinking of your organization, it's like, how do you get that from the top to the bottom? Because at the top, people like ideas. You know, someone has a great idea. Oh, my gosh, let's do that. That's really fun. And then as it filters down, you know, the people are like, oh, my God, we don't want to do that. That's crazy, you know. I think you find more willingness at the staff level and more willingness at the top, and it's kind of that middle, and your, ex your example is exactly kind of that barrier that person there and that's really where we need to focus I think the other thing too is a lot of times in government like you guys are all doing this this if, um, training program and what's happening is you're having like this really great experience you're getting exposed to new ideas and you run back to the office really excited right hey I got this great idea and they go, oh yeah slow down kid you know we're gonna keep doing what we did so I think as a challenge for us is it's again changing the organization across it and so I know at Department of General Services, what we're talking about is how do we kind of train all of our supervisors almost simultaneously on some similar concepts? So if we're talking about how do we really manage change effectively, we can't just say, well, let's hope that we give some change classes and everyone goes to them, or some people do. But if you have people who have gotten exposed and people who haven't, you're going to constantly be having these kind of conflicts because some people aren't even aware that the things they're doing maybe are biased inappropriately or they don't see the advantage of doing those. So I think, again, it's a challenge for us to say, no, it's important to invest in ourselves, our team, uh, so that, and if change is really what the new normal is, then we got to get really good at it. And we got to make sure everyone has a piece in it, not just the people at the bottom, not creating a suggestion box like we used to, you know, and the suggestions pop up to the top, they go, woo, it's a great idea. And then as soon as you filter it down, it kind of dies somewhere, you know, a quiet death. Um, so I think, again, it really goes back to changing our organizations, but changing our organizations together at the same time. And that is a challenge and something that, again, I think we don't always invest in, but we're really looking at how to kind of do a training band where we do all of like the middle managers at once. And then kind of what are those layers that we should go through so that they all kind of have those experiences and bring them back to their workplace. And there's not like you, the oddball out who has the good ideas and no one else wants to embrace those because they didn't kind of get exposed to those new concepts or ideas. Any other? Uh, well, uh, let me just say, look, this is not an easy issue because, and I've been working at it for the last, you know, obviously since I've been at NOES. Um, but, you know, we're, the old saying, you know, you know, in, in California sort of, in any institution, kind of represents 100 years of tradition unimpeded by progress, right? So, um, what, what we have done, to answer your question specifically, is we have built this, this employee-driven idea team that, that it's not just, hey, you know, the director's got an idea and let's, let's or as we said, the suggestion box, guy. those just didn't work. This is something where employees are invested and supported. Uh, we, we, we counter that by doing em annual employee surveys, which, which, which are measuring tools against the idea ambassador core and what's happening within the organization and you have to be um, uh, understanding and, and open and relevant enough to understand what's happening for your customer base you know in our world if we are slow to need slow to respond much like in commissioners world unfortunately people can die it's not like an administrative where you know okay so we didn't get to this and so we're not gonna well, it'll, in the public safety world, we, we got to move. And so that means that we have to be nimble and we have to understand and, and all the organization needs to do that. But that doesn't mean that we don't have challenges in, 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 in the things that were just said where you've got people who are like, look, it's, it's a hassle for me to go and make a change like that or change paperwork or change training. But look, it's the only way that we can stay relevant in today's very, very rapidly changing world. So I would just tell you, bottom up, performance uh, 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 surveys to, to bounce off, and then an executive uh, uh, oversight that and involvement that actually is, it, it is a one team, one fight. Everybody is on the same page with regards to moving forward. I know we're out of time. I'll do this in one minute. Change the world from where you sit today. Just do the best you can within that arena, and things will move. 
in our organization, what we've asked to do, we have incorporated into every promotional exam, every training session, it's in our vision statement, it's in our strategic plan, that you are the changers, the innovators of the world. But we do not accept mediocrity anymore, and we are not keepers of the status quo. We put that right into our strategic plan, and we want people to be innovative. We want them to think outside the box and move things forward. If you're mid-level managers and you're stymied by whatever the, the system is, change the world and where you work, and people will notice it as things go on. I, I'll tell you, but change is difficult. It's, change, it's hard for your superiors. It's hard for your CEO sometimes to really understand that. But I think that we are in prime time to be able to do the changes that we have to do to continue to deliver the best product that we can. And I'd love to talk to you about women in law enforcement first responders. We're not doing a good job. There's a lot of work that has to be done, and I'll share some ideas with you. But your question is very valid, it's appropriate, and it's contemporary, and we need to fix that. Becca, can I say a few words just about my experience of change really quick, too? So just to, to piggyback a little bit um, on what this panel says about, about change and to the gentleman's question, I want to speak a little bit about my own experience from a non-executive level. I'd come back and take in uh, the lean training that Kathleen Webb uh, back there sponsors and uh, change and impact within my organization kind of go hand in hand. And to what Commissioner Farrow said, I made a very small proposal for a change to my, my deputy. Let me go and let me lean some processes. And if I fail, I'll fail fast, but I'll fail smart because I've got some training behind me. And if it doesn't work, it's not really going to impact too many people. So no one's really gonna know about it. Let me just give this a shot. I did it, it was a, a huge success. And so I do encourage that lean training because it is proven not just within state government, but just around the world. And from that, my deputy has given, um, has the confidence in investing in me to be able to make more incremental changes. And so today, I actually now am helping at the department level with some strategic planning efforts. So I'd say, you know, take that idea, start small, like this panel's talking about, have your, uh, your folks um, build some confidence around the things because you're proving what you can do, and then just take that energy and move forward, and you'll really see um, some difference. And, and this training program will help with that as well. So thank you.